good, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And first of all, I would like uh, to thank the organizers. Uh, thanks to Tara and Sebastiano for inviting me. Uh, also, the field work activities at Tel Abu Habil have just started, and uh, therefore I have much, much more questions and answers. And this is really a very preliminary presentation and speech, very, very preliminary. So I hope this speech will not be too frustrating because what I would like to discuss with you today are above all questions and the issues underlying the lab job project. Because the excavation at Tel Abu Habil are part of the of a French Jordanian joint project called the lab job late prehistoric Jordan Basin project focusing on the Jordan Basin as a cradle of proto-urban complexity. From an archaeological point of view, the Jordan Valley is extremely interesting since it's very early, very early prehistory, starting from its complex geology uh, with the rift that runs through it and now allows the Jordan River to flow towards the south, towards the deep depression of the Dead Sea, and then for the corridor role played by the Jordan Valley uh, during the exit of the Homo sapiens from Africa, or for the formation of the prehistoric, the gigantic prehistoric lake called the Lysian, which disappeared at the beginning of the dawn of the Holocene. Well, I'm not a specialist in all these issues, and I'm not going to talk about them today. Within the framework of our expedition of our team, the real expert of these dynamics is the co-director, Professor Fuad Horani of the University of Jordan. He is a great specialist in settlement dynamics, a fine geomorpho geomorphologist and geoarchaeologist, and a connoisseur in relation to physical and geomorphological formation of sites. Hello. What I, um, what I will present today, uh, my focus today will be rather on the questions asked by some findings dating from the 6th, 4th millennium, especially, especially early 4th, 4th millennium BC. And uh, at that time, the 4th millennium, the main interest of the Jordan Valley was already the same as today. The main interest for settling the Jordan Valley was the same as today, namely the fertility of the Jordan Valley. In a very harsh desert environment, today the testy strawberries in the Western Asia are grown in greenhouses in the Jordan Valley, as you can see in the photo. But uh, this was not, this is not, of course, the only fertile region and area of the Fertile Crescent. So why to investigate the Jordan Valley, in particular, why the Lepcho project focuses on this area? Of course, we are not, not at all the first archaeologists to be interested in the local calcolithic, namely the phase during which the Levant and in particular the Jordan Valley walked the path towards the a proper proto-urban level and stage of urban proto-urban complexity and social and organizational complexity. Just to mention some, just to mention few project of excavation in the Jordan Valley, we have, we can mention, for instance, some excavations of the 90s. The 90s have been a very important period for the calcolithic excavations and findings in the Jordan Valley. For instance, at Tel Tubna, the excavation run by Professor Benning, University of Toronto. To be precise, the Tel Tubna is rather located in the Wadi Ziklab, but close to the Jordan area. Uh, it is uh, located in the middle Jordan Valley, the very important multi-period site of Pella, uh, excavated by the University of, S of Sydney, Professor Stephen Bourke, and the multi-period site of uh, Tel Eshuna North, close to Tel Abu Habil, uh, with uh, calcolithic layers reached by Professors Baird and Philip uh, from Durham University. But if we talk about, uh, for instance, another French, expedition in this area, because Tel Abu Habil is a French-Jordanian joint project. Uh, a very close site to Tel Abu Habil is Tel Abu Hamid, um, excavated during the 80s and the 90s by the late Madame Genevieve Dorfus. And 
I, I wouldn't say that the most important, it, it may be even the most important, but in any case, the most iconic excavation of the Jordan Valley is um, for sure Tel El Gasul, which is a Chalcolithic village and the, nepo the eponymous site of the so-called Rasulian culture. Uh, well, I'm quite allergic to the term, but above all to the notion, to the idea of um, archaeological culture with um, means um, almost nothing to me. But if we want to uh, evoke in a very synthetic way, even in a vague way, uh, all the uh, complex system of um, archaeology and material culture which goes along with this period, the Calcolithic period in the Southern Levant and especially in the Jordan Valley, we can speak of the so-called Gasulian um, cultural entity, to not to say Gasulian culture. The Lat Gasul has been excavated at the end of the 20s and during the 30s by the Institut Public Pontifical by Mellon. And then the University of Sydney has a long, long history of the excavations at Tel El Gasul during the 60s and 70s by Professor Hennessy, and then at the middle of the 90s by Professor Burke. But these are just uh, some sites and excavations located on the Georgi Jordanian bulk of the Jordan Valley, because of course there are a lot, a lot of very interesting and um, important sites excavated since uh, dozens of years uh, on the Israeli site uh, at Tel Farah, Bet Shehan, Tel Saf, and so on. So we have intense investigation of several sites on the two sides of the Jordan River. But we still have crucial questions still open because uh, we have quite a, quite a good information about local calculatic. Now, of course, in, in archaeology, information is never enough. But uh, our information about local calculitic is quite good. The problem is that we are almost completely blind about very, very, some very, very ba ba basic and important issues. For instance, as far as chronology and cultural evolution, according with chronology, namely a very basic issue, a very basic way to answer to a basic questions as, as uh, when things happen. In the last 20 years, many advances in radiocarbon dates have been made, but as already demonstrated some years ago by a quite old uh, but very important uh, paper published uh, something like 14 or 13 years ago by Professor Benning in the Paleorian Journal, uh, we still have uh, a lot of difficulties to synchronize the different cultural pages. Indeed, we know that at the beginning of the Calcolithic, the cultural panorama was very fragmented with various cultural entities between the Jordan Valley, the Negev Desert, and the whole Southern Levant. While some centuries later, during the last quarter of the fifth millennium BC, even if the cultural fragmentation persisted, of course, the cultural landscape was much more homogeneous with the Jordan Valley and a large portion of the Southern Levant occupied by the so-called Rasulian entity. But we, are, we still have very significant chronological uncertainties with persistent problems in the synchronization of stratigraphy, ceramic assemblages and radiocarbon dating. And above all about ceramic assemblages, it, this is a very uh, serious problem because especially in a context of cultural fragmentation, we really need, we have, we have important need for very reliable relative chronologies based on very well, well balanced uh, uh, ceramic repertoires. We also have a very serious lack of information on our architectural patterns because we have a lack of extensive excavations. The, the most extensive uh, or maybe the, the, the only real extensive excavation in the Jordan Valley is represented by Tel El Gasul. Uh, there are, of course, uh, some large soundings uh, on other sides, uh, but most of the time there are some trenches. Very interesting, very important, but uh, uh, it's not enough to have uh, parallels to establish typologies, reliable typologies of workspaces, um, workshops, uh, domestic areas, uh, communal buildings, and so on. 
we don't even know even we don't even know if the dwellings the houses have in this period uh, some some kind of standardized pattern or standardized plan and uh, this problem of mm, consisting in a relatively small mm, or surface limited excavations is quite important because uh, on the other hand we clearly know that the calcolithic is a phase uh, of growing complexity characterized by social phenomena and dynamics that find their lowest common denominator in these increased organizational complexity not only in on a local level but also in super regional connections and when i say social complexity i mean that we know we absolutely perfectly know that the calcolithic in the southern levant implies a very clear increase in the density settlements and not only settlements and so the density but but also extension and surface of the settlements we observe during the local calcolithic the first introduction of sanctuaries of the little temples with the clear diffusion of cemeteries and ossuaries and secondary burials and with a clear growing in public ritual pub practices that become more and more important we also have a clear development of symbolic motifs sculpted painted on different kind of artifacts pottery basalt copper and ivory and bones and so on and last but not least we have the first appearance of metallurgy to have just a, an idea of the importance of this local invention we can have a look for instance to another very very complex cradle of civilization of another organizational system different of course but as complex and as well ranked as the levantine one in mesopotamia in this period mesopotamia is uh, mesopotamia is characterized by an increasing um, series of phenomena um, based on social complexity but there is no evidence at all for mesopotamian local metallurgy on the contrary in the southern levant especially in the southern part of the jordan valley i would say that um, the the area around the dead sea is literally the cradle of the first metallurgy we even have the first emergence of uh, the first uh, evidence for a complex technique like the so-called lost wax technique for testing copper anyway there is a persisting idea of these calcolithic societies as relatively peripheral isolated groups fragmented without real relations outside their territorial sphere and it has long been known to be false it is false of course of course we we have even some proofs very clear proofs coming even from Tel Abuhabil and from other nearby sites like Katarita Samara, Bet Shehan, Tel Saf and so on where mm, there is a certain percentage of Mesopotamian like Mesopotamian related pottery like this shirt and other shirts this shirt you can see in the photo at Tel Abuhabil uh, Ubaid related shirt the Ubaid Mesopotamian shirt these are of course uh, small quantities but quite stable between three and five percent which is not so little and uh, as percentage and which is not it's not possible to consider this quantity of mesopotamian related pottery as an isolated oddity but rather as an evidence for supra regional relationships so it seems to me it seems to us interesting to investigate a small rural site uh, in a very intensely cultivated environment at the foot of the Jordanian plateau, very small site, less than one hectare, like Tel Abuhabil. In the uh, aerial view, you can see in the upper part of the slide, uh, you can see the parcels of the, of the Jordanian cadaster. And this aerial view um, seems significant to me to show you because uh, it is very, very clear. And it is very, very green on this side. It's very green, densely, densely cultivated and intensely cultivated area, very wet, very humid on uh, to the west, 
towards the Jordan, Jordan River, which is just 350 meters away, while the same photo is very, very yellow, dry, arid on the other side to the east, where is located the first uh, relief of the Jordanian Plateau. And uh, Tel Abu Habil uh, in this area called uh, El Yabis, south of the Wadi Rayyan, is situated in this, uh, of course, very fertile area, but in a quite delicate, in a quite uh, sensible zone, very exposed to uh, climatic crisis and environmental crisis, uh, as we will see later. It has been uh, first explored by Gluck and later sounded by Mellert and de Contenson at the beginning of the 50s. It was surveyed once again in 1975 by Ibrahim Sauer and Yassin, and it yielded uh, uh, quite a lot of Neolithic and Calcolithic stuff, so pottery shirts, uh, plain tools that were studied by Professor Zaydan Kavafi in his uh, PhD thesis. Uh, the main phases of occupation recognized by these first uh, surveys uh, were the same uh, we have recognized during our own survey survey and we will see this later especially six for millennium bc but uh, uh, when we uh, saw the, for the first time Tel Abu Habil, uh, it seemed to us like a somewhat threatened side because in this area uh, to the western portion, but large portion of the site, uh, the site have been uh, flattened, deeply flattened by uh, military bulldozers during the 80s. And in this area, we even have, uh, and this is an archaeological area, of course, uh, interesting archaeological calcolithic area. This is even a palm plantation. So uh, we carried out uh, surface survey uh, starting in 2018 and you can see some results of our surface collection with the according with the division of the um, cadastral parcels and lots and you can see the quantity and dating of the findings especially pottery shirts according with the more or less dark gray color of the parcels but to to resume in a very synthetic way the the results since the six millennium BC, we have some few, some rare, but some little connections with Mesopotamia, with the appearance of uh, Mesopotamia like, cubate like shirts, like this one with the cross edged painted motifs, very simple geometric motifs, but clearly cubate connected motifs. Uh, even if uh, since the six millennium BC, of course, the bulk, the large amount, the large majority of the, um, of the assemblage is local and uh, uh, Wadi Raba um, classical assemblages. Then in the fifth millennium BC, the local assemblages, of course, uh, uh, belong to the Rasulian repertoire. Then we have a, a early fourth millennium occupation at the uh, transition between Calcolithic and early Bronze Age one. We will see this um, later. And we have a later, um, much later occupation uh, dating from the 7th, 8th uh, centuries of our era, uh, from the early Byzantine period, which is quite normal because not only Tel Abu Habil, but uh, the whole Jordan Valley was uh, reoccupied by several, several agricultural installations during the early Byzantine period. So we have uh, brittleware, cooking pots, and very common potteries. But what what is really surprising, what was very surprising for us, was the fact that, especially in the, the part of the site that was leveled by military bulldozers in the 80s, a very significant occupation is represented by, transition, by the transition between Calcolithic and Early Bronze Age I. And this phase has been for decades and still is considered as the huge documentary gap, quite a mystery because uh, nobody really understands, nobody really knows what happened at the end of a flourishing phase like the Calcolithic and why a densely inhabited territory and densely cultivated territory like uh, the Jordan Valley with many villages, um, of course, little, small, little Calcolithic villages, but uh, 
closely connected to each other and uh, closely interacting to each other, uh, what happened after a flourishing phase like the Chalcolithic in the Jordan Valley and why at the beginning of the early Bronze Age, the Jordan Valley became a sort of large empty space. Uh, until some years ago, until 2012, 2013, several scholars believed that the Jordan Valley was um, completely abandoned at the very beginning of the early Bronze Age between late Calcolithic and the middle of the early Bronze Age A1. If we speak in terms of um, uh, absolute chronology, it corresponds to something like 4000 or 3900 BC until 3800, 2700 BC. Then, uh, after 2010, we had the, some discoveries uh, of transitional occupations, especially in Israel, uh, with some sites between the Jordan Valley and uh, Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, to be precise, some of these sites, like even important sites like Modin, are not really located in the Jordan Valley. Modin, for instance, is located in the Shefela Valley. But we also have a very interesting and important sites, not really a site, a cluster of sites like Fazael in the Jordan Valley on the Israeli bank. So the transition between Calcolithic and Early Bronze Age was not, wasn't a real generalized total abandonment for the Jordan Valley, but uh, it was, in, a, in any case, a very serious, a very large and deep crisis, probably uh, because of environmental reasons. But how can we explain this brutal decrease in the settlement number, and not only in settlement number, but only in settlement location and extension? What was very um, interesting, but also surprising, was the fact, the fact that in the face of abandonment or virtual abandonment, what we have found at Tel Bohabil is a huge ceramic worship. So far, we have identified 45 kilns, uh, excavated 25 kilns uh, on a surface, an excavated surface of about 250 square meters. Tel Bohabil is very little, less than one hectare. But we didn't identify the limits of the worship. On the contrary, we found that the worship extended um, into different areas of the site. This area, this southern area, this area in area B, and here also in different areas uh, of the sites, uh, even areas distant from each other. We, uh, we found the, the kilns were quite large, quite um, well constructed and quite large for this period. And above all, the kilns were very intensely exploited and used, constantly reused, restored, repaired with layers and layers of clay uh, spread and applied to reinforce and restore the walls of the kilns. We thought that this might not be a worship. I mean, not just one worship, but different, several working areas. But uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, the fact that mm, this worship or working areas has been identified in different parts, in distant sites, uh, parts of the site, makes it very unlikely that in the middle of such an intensely used environment, such an intensely polluted and contaminated environment, contaminated by fumes, smokes, firing waste, uh, slags, uh, there were there were also houses. Maybe there were there wasn't even space, physical space for houses. But in any case, it, it would have been a very very place, very bad place to live. So it's quite possible that the whole of the central area of this little site, Tel Bohabil, uh, during the Calcolithic, uh, the, 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 the very late Calcolithic and the very beginning of the early Bronze Age, one consisted in a pottery worship, a large pottery factory at the time when the valley should have been virtually abandoned. And of course, this raises problems and questions because it's all very well producing ceramics, but so much of production and on a such a concentrated and maybe centralized way for whom it was this production. In the forthcoming campaign, of course, these um, questions will be our main issues and our main goals. 
But what we have for the moment is this evidence, this large worship. Now, pottery kilns are hardly ever carefully excavated. I am a pottery technologist, a pottery technology specialist, and production techniques interest me very, very much. But I myself was rather interested in finding finding houses, for instance, at Tel Abuhabil. And I would uh, have preferred so much to get information um, about the organization of the domestic or public spaces, for instance. So I perfectly understand that you are not in love with pottery kilns, but we have kilns and we have to deal with them. So what do they tell us? What I would like to do now is to take a little diversion uh, in this talk and explain um, what a ceramic kiln is and how it works. Then uh, you will see that this is interesting for some of the main issues raised by the worship of Tel Abu Habil. First of all, what a ceramic pottery kiln is? A pottery kiln is the place where clays, or rather clay hearts, silts and clays, sands and all the materials, um, all the clays materials of which uh, vessels are composed. Pottery kiln is the place, the physical place, where clays were, are irreversibly transformed into ceramics, namely into a type of synthetic stone, the first synthetic product in the history of humankind. This kind of definition is quite a polytheistic definition because, of course, the kiln is a physical place, tangible physical place. But its nature is determined by a process, something not, not immediately tangible, something very material, of course, but not immediately tangible, by a process taking place inside the kiln. In fact, kilns have a twofold nature, both architectural structures and engines, a machine, we would say in physics, where the energy of a fuel is partly used to obtain a product, pottery, ceramics, and parts, partly dispersed by entropy in the environment with heating. As structures, the kilns can be classified in architectural typologies, according with their masonry parts, their plants, of course, and their internal parts. As machines, kilns can be classified into technical typologies, depending on the barring of the different insulation solutions, and above all, on the quality and, quant and, and orientation of the circulation of the hot air inside their structure and outside their structure, namely the draft. The basic type of kilns are precisely defined by the combination of these um, structural and technical criteria, and I will show you um, few, very few examples from excavations, experimental reconstruction, and even some currently used kilns. First of all, bonfires. Bonfires can be superficial, partly, or deeply buried in the ground, so they uh, can be built in a pile or excavated in a pit. But even the term of built, building a bonfire, it's not very appropriate because uh, uh, bonfire represents the very basic degree, the ground zero degree uh, of the kiln in, in architectural terms, because they have no masonry part, not at all, and the fuel uh, and the pots are not uh, are just piled up together and are, are not separated without any kind of separation. The draft is uh, random according to the holes uh, that open up in the pile during the firing process, the firing cycle. The principle is the same for um, piles uh, with a hard built uh, edge at the base, hard built edge that encircles them at the base, like this one in the photo. Single room kilns are intermediate structures. They are, of course, piles of fuel and boats without any separation, like bonfires, but they also are bricked up. And the draft is random inside the structure, but they have a very good circulation of air. Vertical draft kilns are constructed kilns where a separation, namely uh, an intermediate pierced sole, has been introduced between the fuel which burns in a super superficial or buried um, lower heating chamber 
and the pots accumulated stacked up in an upper firing chamber. Thus, the draft follows this vertical axis between the fuel and the material to be fired. While in the so-called horizontal draft installations, the circulation of the air is not really horizontal, it's quite actually oblique due to the slopes, to the benches on which the pots are placed a step higher than the fuel. These very basic typologies can have countless practical variations, giving rise to an enormous variability of firing traditions uh, over space and time, of course. So how can this variability be accounted for? In archaeology, often in archaeology, the complexity of the architectural articulation, architectural structure of a kiln is generally considered to reveal its technical complexity, which is supposed to be progressive, linear. Thus, increasingly structured types of kilns are considered to be increasingly adapted responses to constraints, environmental or technical constraints in order to obtain better performance from the simple bonfire the peat bonfire the single room kilns vertical kilns to horizontal kilns the goal of the craftspeople in any place at any time would be and would have been to obtain a better control on temperature heat rise and oxygen supply by a partial or complete insulation of the vessels and the fuel but realistic or not, this linear evolutionary scenario has the advantage of presenting the benefits of a range of devices and arrangement put in place by past and, of course, present craftspeople. But it uh, doesn't explain how and why many kilns appear only in certain areas and only at certain times, why they are so peculiar. And this is important for the story that the workshop of Della Bohabil tells us because. Uh, this uh, linear evolution, this uh, linear evolution um, starting from superficial bonfires, peat bonfires, and then single room kilns, vertical kilns, uh, horizontal draft kilns. This linear evolution is a very effective uh, schematic representation, but it's not true. It's not true at all. This is not a real explanation. Of course, it is certain, even tautological, that the use of different type of kilns as some kind of relationship to the environment and to the technical tasks, but the attempt to search for a short list of factors and most of the time just one factor as the reason for the adoption of a firing system of a type of kiln can only lead to simplistic and ultimately false answers. In archaeology, our attention about thermal behavior namely performance of a firing structure of a kiln, has crystallized around three main criteria. The speed of the heating, the maximum temperature reached, and the time of exposure to maximum heat. These are critical factors, especially in relation to the frequency of accidents and breakages. So whatever, whatever the type of kiln, the vague notion of performance can be defined in uh, less nebulous, more precise way to li limiting this notion of performance to some decisive passages, decisive thresholds and transformation, physical chemical transformation happening during the firing cycles. For instance, the dehydroxylation. The dehydroxylation is the process of the last the disappearance of very, very little uh, last remains of humidity of uh, water within the molecular structure of the clay uh, this uh, process happens around 600 degrees during the firing cycles but there are also several other physical chemical very characteristic transformation like the structural change of quartz the dissociation of calcium carbonate vitrification and so on all these physical chemical transformations happen around very specific thermal thresholds. The way this transformation happen, the ability of the different types of kilns to make these transformation occur is what we call performance. And therefore it's quite surprising to observe that for all these very significant physical chemical transformations during the firing cycles, 
experimental lepidemiographic data agree on the fact that it is possible to reach temperature above these thresholds quickly or to keep the vessels for a few minutes longer around the lower thermal threshold for this transformation to take place. They take place anyway, either if we exceed very quickly certain temperature thresholds and also if we maintain a lower temperature but for a longer period of time. In other words, this physical chemical transformation, this uh, very physical chemical characteristic um, features of the performance of a firing cycle happen without any kind of difficulty, regardless the type of kiln, and depend rather on the way the operations are carried out. Therefore, there is no one type of structure of kiln that performs better than the other, and everything depends on how the firing is handled according to the circumstances, to the skills of the potters, and of course, according to the te technical goals, according to the specific kind of ceramics and materials we have to, we want to fire. Firing technologies, kilns, uh, as any other step of the manufacturing process vary, of course, on the basis of possible adaptation to particular conditions, but above all, they vary on the basis of arbitrary and traditional factors. This is indeed the domain of culture. And there is no type of kiln that really is, this, that is really able to reduce the losses the degree of losses at the end of a firing cycle. The same uh, can be said about maximum temperature, because if we push the different type of kids, uh, if we push them by feeding them with fuel and even without using bellows, because the, on, the, the, the only traces for bellows in ancient Egypt and uh, uh, Western Asia are uh, rather related to metal furnaces, but even without the use of any kind of bellow, all the type of kilns, they all reach very, very high peaks of temperature between 980 degrees and 1100 degrees. And if you use bellows, you can easily, very easily uh, reach, especially in very simple bonfires, in peat bonfires, very, very high temperature between 1,370 and 1,530 degrees, well beyond the melting limit of iron and well beyond temperature used for the firing of pottery. These temperatures are completely useless because pottery in prehistory, as today, uh, was fired without almost ever exceeding 950 degrees, but most of the time to lower, lower temperature. Horizontal draft kilns are indeed a very advanced technology with very marginal breakage rates, strong capacities to save fuel. And uh, as far as temperature, they can easily reach, once again, without using any kind of bellows, 1,500 degrees. And once again, it is completely useless. It is far beyond the air melting temperature. Indeed, the horizontal oblique circulation of the air in these horizontal kilns ensure that these kilns absorb and release the heat very homogeneous throughout their structure. Pots fire thanks to a uni uniform radiation of heat from all parts of these installations. Personally, I have attended uh, and participated only in four uh, experimental constructions and experimental sessions of firing with this horizontal type of kilns, but ethnographic data and experimental sessions underline that paradoxically, the, of course, remarkable technical features of these horizontal kilns often, very often end up being limited very serious limit because the construction of the small horizontal kilns is a very complex operation. The maintenance of horizontal kilns is quite complex and the firing cycles require constant attention and intervention by the potter so that the temperature does not rise too high and melt the vessels. Once again, there are no type of kilns that are in themselves superior to others, better in themselves, more advanced in, them, in themselves, or more advisable for their effect uh, and performance. 
the variability of kilns depends on arbitrary and purely cultural traditions, once again. Why it is so important for Telabohabil? Because a Telabohabil, between the end of the Chalcolithic and the very beginning of the early Bronze Age one, there is a transition from a phase in which there are only, only vertical kilns in the worship to a phase in which there are both vertical and horizontal kilns. Between these two phases, there is an abandonment of the whole area, the whole site, the, all the firing structure, and the worship was no longer in use. And if we observe the microstratigraphy of the entire area, it is quite clear, quite evident that the abandonment coincided with a moment of particularly severe climatic conditions with a frequent episode of intense rain since you can see actual mud flows probably coming as avalanches, several avalanches of mud flows uh, from the Jordanian plateau or mud flows due to the overflowing of the Jordan River groundwater naps. Before this abandonment, only vertical draft kilns were used throughout the worship. Then after the abandonment, the worship was reoccupied and there were both vertical and horizontal kilns amongst the firing structures. This may seem like a minor change, but it is not. It is all the more difficult to understand what happened between these two phases of occupation of the worship, Tel Abu Habil, because this um, technical change does not affect ceramic techniques in general. The ceramic assemblage has been analyzed from a technical point of view and the shaping method of the ceramic is exactly the same with exactly the same steps, the same technical gestures for the manufacturer during the first phase of the worship but during the second one. Furthermore, this shaping method, this operational sequence is not surprising in itself. Indeed, it has been recently even recognized by Dr. Valentin Roux throughout the Southern Levant during the Calcolithic and it is typical of the entire Krasulian cultural area. In other terms, this operational sequence, this shaping method, corresponds to the technique typical of the people living in the Jordan Valley and in the large part of the Southern Levant during the Calcolithic. It was their very distinctive way of doing, of producing ceramics. So it's not surprising to observe that this same technique and the same people underlying this technique persist at the very beginning of the early Bronze Age one. Concerning ceramic pastes, uh, we, mm, we observe quite similar continuity. During the first phase of the worship, vessels were made by using two different types of mineral tempered fabrics. I call them A and B pastes. They were quite similar, but let's say that a paste are more calcareous and with some quartz, while B paste have a certain presence of basalt. Nothing exceptional compared to the rest of the Jordan Valley, both in Jordan and in Israel. And also after the abandonment and the reoccupation of the worship, there's nothing extraordinary. Okay, of course, A paste disappear after the abandonment but they are replaced by a very similar group of pastes. I call them A1 because it is essentially the same fabric with, but with just the addition of grog. Uh, grog, uh, we, we define grog, uh, crushed ceramic, uh, powdered ceramics uh, used as, uh, uh, as inclusions, mixed with uh, clays and used as inclusion to um, produce New, pot, new pots and the first appearance of grog in the Southern Levant dates back to the very beginning of the early Bronze Age one. So uh, the appearance of grog in, after the abandonment of the, of the worship at El Abohabil is quite normal. Moreover, after the abandonment and the reoccupation of the worship, we still have B paste exactly the same as before the abandonment. Therefore, the continuity is quite strong. So why there is the appearance of a radically new firing modality like uh, the horizontal draft technology? <clears throat> it, is, uh, it, is, it is quite amazing because this kind of uh, horizontal kilns are not typical at all of the Southern Levant in this period and uh, they were not spread everywhere. They're not documented in the surroundings. At the same time, uh, we have seen that this is quite 
useless to try to explain these kind of changes and evolution or innovations on the basis of supposed adaptation to the environment or for some kind of better performance. It is rather cultural, but cultural in which sense? We just can have a look very quick, very quickly uh, to uh, current technographic example, for instance, at uh, Mahastan in Bangladesh, but is the same situation in uh, Rajasthan in India. Uh, there are some modern craftspeople, um, potters, who all belong to the same social group and kinship group, or even to the same lineage in a very broad sense. They make the same ceramics by the same operational sequence, but they use two very different types of kills. They fire ceramics in, first of all, you can see in the upper part of the slide, in uh, pile bonfire firing, piled up against a brick, vault, uh, brick built uh, mouth of the kiln, this kiln, which is typical of this area and documented in the surrounding, well, very well documented. But they also use a vertical kiln with the uh, lower chamber deeply buried in the ground and the uh, pots uh, stacked up and piled up uh, uh, on the ground, covered by layer mud and straw, as you can see here. Indeed, this uh, vertical kiln is not documented at all in the surroundings. And this isolated innovation is indeed just the attempt of a potter by a potter who lived uh, for a long time in the capital to reproduce a vertical industrial kiln. And similar results, as uh, I said before, uh, have been observed in Rajasthan in India. In other terms, a potter or a family of specialists introduced in a certain context, a, a quite homogeneous context as far as firing technologies and kilns, they introduce an innovation, which is indeed borrowing, adapting firing technique learned and observed elsewhere. And it could be also the case observed at Tel Abohabil at the transition between Calcolithic and early Bronze Age one. Just to resume, there are two groups of, two groups of distinct, distinct groups of craftspeople, most probably belonging to the same lineage in the broad sense of the term because they made ceramics by the same modalities in this case by the same operational sequence documented throughout the Southern Levant during the Calcolithic, and so far everything is good, everything is normal. But kilns are problematic. Since the first construction of the large workshop identified at Al-Bohabil, craftspeople who shaped A and B paste according to the single method, shaping method, fired both in vertical kilns, always vertical kilns, which are also documented in the rest of the Levant. At that time, they are not very well documented, but we have some parallels. Then, after temporary abandonment of the site, uh, some potters, some producers, uh, resettled and reoccupied the workshop. Some of them still used B paste, already attested before the abandonment, and they continued to fire vessels in vertical kilns, exactly the same as before. Some other artisans used a variant, very close variant to A paste, uh, A1 paste with the normal addition of grog. And they also adopt something completely inconceivable, horizontal kilns. What happened after this abandonment? Did some local potters spend time elsewhere, like Bengali or Indian potters, and then came back with some kind of bizarre firing method and technology? I'm not joking because this uh, question can help us to, to change a little bit and better understand um, our understanding of the settlement dynamics of the Jordan Valley. It's not just, just a matter of technologies, kilns, potters, and, and pot pottery technology, but uh, it's also maybe, first of all, a matter of um, settlement dynamics. Because we have two different, two different uh, hypotheses and possibilities. According to the first one, horizontal kilns were a uh, local innovation. 
Then the early fourth millennium, the transition between Calcolithic and early for, uh, Bronze Age one, would appear to be as a period of heterogeneous and stable technical choices, but the very notion of crisis, of local crisis, maybe should be reassessed because this period also would appear as a very important period for some local innovations. Otherwise, according to a second hypothesis, horizontal kilns are analogenic foreign technical borrowing. This would indicate that the transition between Calcolithic and Early Bronze Age was rather a real, deep social environmental crisis marked by a strong social and geographical mobility. I mean, physical mobility of people leaving the place where they live, leaving their villages, leaving the Jordan Valley, leaving the workshop of Tel Abu Habil, and establishing contacts and interactions with other distant groups of people and potters, and then resettling, coming back in the valley towards 3800 BC and, come and bringing with them some kinds of new technologies like the horizontal kilns. As you can guess, uh, I think uh, uh, the second hypothesis with strong physical mobility and social mobility of people from the Jordan Valley, abandoning the Jordan Valley, abandoning the, the, the establishment of Tel Abu Habil, different installations of the area, establishing relations and interactions with other peoples, and then coming back and bringing back uh, new technologies would be more plausible. But uh, uh, I don't have an answer, a definite answer for the moment. And an answer will have to be checked in the next campaigns at Tel Habil, of course. And as I told you at the beginning, it is, this is just a very, very preliminary presentation of our very preliminary results. The only thing I can do for the moment is to thank the whole team of Tel Habil, Professor Fouad Horani, the co-director of the expedition, and Sophie Laurent, Fiona Pichon, Claire Padovani, and all the workers of Tel Habil. And of course, to thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. 